What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We are an internet radio station and you can find us at www.indielive.radio. We are a community of volunteer broadcasters to entertain and inform. Click on the Schedule tab to find out what's on every day of the week. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have, and we're on 24-7. There's something for everyone, so please give us a try. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. Indie Live Radio is a new voice for a new Scotland. Join us. Thanks for listening. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash What's On Guide.
Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing our programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is the latest installment of Building the Scottish State, and I have the great pleasure to have with me MP uh, Philip, Philip Whitford with me to talk, uh, talk about uh, several issues this evening. So first of all, thank you for thank you for being with us. You're very welcome. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to start. Uh, I, I received a very pleasant surprise the other day because I was going through the I saw some Scottish currency notes up on on the uh, so on the social media. And I went to that and, and apparently it's it's bills for the Sc uh, Scottish Reserve Bank, uh, and I went to the uh, the site and I found a timeline that says that on Thursday, 9th of September, twenty twenty one, Scotland will vote in a second referendum. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and I was wondering if you had any insight into that. I mean, is that part of the? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, I think it would be a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be um, seven years since our last independence referendum in September 14. And the only, you know, all this once in a generation stuff is complete nonsense. It wasn't in the Edinburgh Agreement. And all the major parties signed the Smith Commission report after the referendum. And that very clearly said there is nothing in this report that stops Scotland becoming an independent country in the future should her people so choose. So they signed up to that after the referendums. The whole once in a generation is nonsense. But the only legal um, timing between generations is set in the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. And that says that the people of Northern Ireland can have a border pull no closer together than every seven years. Mm -hmm. And obviously part of that is that you would have two general elections or two elections between that, which okay. means that you can assess that a, a wish to have that is, is a consistent wish in the population, not just something driven by, um, you know, some kind of flash uh, outcome. Well, okay. you know, we've had three general elections. We're about to have our second 
Holyrood election, we've had local elections and uh, European elections, and the SNP have won all of them since mm-hmm. that referendum. So, you know, I think we basically meet the tenets of that. So to me, that would be quite a good time. It also means that the campaigning would just literally keep going after the election. But I, you know, this is way above my pay grade. So no, there's nothing, uh, nothing secret that I know. Um, I I just would love it to be uh, next September. Because I was uh, chatting with um, uh, Gordon McIntyre Kemp, and he said that that, that this was very likely be in, basically be in the the manifesto for the, uh, the, that, uh, you know, for for the Holyrood elections in May. And so, and they, they would campaign on, uh, both the new currency and uh, you know the specific date uh, of this uh, of this one. So I let's hope <laughs> that's all I can yeah, say. I mean, I, I'm I I don't know about that as a, a okay. date being in the manifesto. I mean, I haven't seen any of the proposals for the manifesto as yet. But the um, I the, I think there is no question that certainly an independence referendum will be and independence will be front and center of that mm-hmm. manifesto. Um, whether it's got a specific currency or anything else. And I, frankly, I don't know, but I, I'm not in any doubt that um, our right to independence and our right to, to choose. And that's the key thing. I don't expect Labour or the Tories or anything to campaign for independence or give us an easy ride, though I have to say Labour would have a better future if they did, particularly when 40% of their supporters actually support independence but the idea that they should deny us the right to make our own decision that's the thing it's so utterly um undemocratic yeah okay and uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, about your life in westminster or away from westminster and uh, what are the how are the logistics of that going we were just talking about it a little bit earlier but uh, with regard to voting with regard to just uh, you know uh, working from working from home working from a distance uh, what's the how has that been how has that been functioning um well obviously uh, we went into lockdown kind of third week in march um and the Easter break, the Easter recess came kind of quite quickly, really, on top of that at the end of March. And by the time we came back, um, the digital department in Westminster had actually done a fantastic job. They had uh, the ability for us to contribute virtually in the chamber. They had big TV screens up. They had set up electronic remote digital voting, which was Mm -hmm. quite an achievement. Um, and all of that, we, we have a virtual protected network. I mean, we're signing in with a password. We have dual authorization, all sorts of security measures to get in. Mm-hmm. And they were using that also for the people in the chamber so that we weren't doing that kind of trawling through the lobbies. And as, as someone who was not attending Westminster, I could take part in everything other than uh, legislative committees. So I could take part in debates, I could take part in the legislative debates, but just not in where it had to go to a committee room. And then basically Rees-Mogg shut it all down at the end of May. Mm -hmm. There was the debate on the 2nd of June about having at least something for those of us who couldn't attend Westminster. And the most shocking thing was they had a 90-minute debate on virtual access to Parliament. And those of us who couldn't attend were excluded. They already applied the physical attendance only, physical voting only rule to that debate. So uh, my understanding is it's well over 100 MPs who, of course, would have voted to continue um, the hybrid parliament were, were excluded from the debate that made that decision. So since then, I've been able to take part in things like parliamentary questions and urgent statements but we had a medicines and medical devices bill. Um, Kindly, one of the labor front benchers laid amendments and new clauses for me, Mm -hmm. Um, but I couldn't take part in it. I couldn't take part in the bill committee. So I had to go down a couple of weeks ago because I had a private member's bill, which would have had to be withdrawn if I didn't physically attend and I was able to speak in the internal market bill. But I find... I find it outrageous that there are so many MPs excluded when the digital setup and technology had already been put into place. 
And particularly now with numbers rising and going into the winter, the idea that you're going to be pulling 600 MPs up and down from all over the UK in, in the middle of this pandemic, it's, it's just utterly bonkers. Is it just, a, I mean, in your view, is it just a d- deliberate on their part to disenfranchise many, many, many MPs, particularly people who come from Scotland? Um, I don't, well, it, it doesn't just disenfranchise us. I mean, it's particularly MPs who are shielding, MPs who have someone in their family who's shielding or high risk. Mm-hmm. So those are the people who really, and obviously older MPs over 70, many of them just simply can't, you know, they can't attend. Um, obviously for all of us from Scotland or the very north of England or Northern Ireland, where we have quite long journeys to make, that journey itself is dangerous. You're spending, you know, four or five hours on a train or you're sitting in a plane and, and, um, you know, all the seats are full. So you're completely surrounded by people you don't know. And the only, um, the only protection is that you have a face covering on. But other than that, that, you know, all the seats in the, the plane when we flew down two weeks ago were, all occupied. So, um, you know, I, I, I think to me, I think it's the traditionalists. I think it's Rhys Mogg. They have a nostalgia for, you know, the debating and the shouting and all this kind of stuff. And I think particularly at the beginning, Boris Johnson was looking very lost at mm-hmm. Prime Minister's questions without a kind of group of cheerleaders. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think a lot of it was was that. But of course, you can still only have 50 MPs in the chamber. So you can't change that. You know, it's still less rowdy and less noisy and, you know, doesn't have the atmosphere. I mean, you know, as, as somebody had said to me, you know, if you're sitting up a tree because there's a lion prowling around the bottom, uh-huh. You don't come down the tree just because you got a bit uncomfortable. Uh-huh. You know, you actually wait till the lion has gone away and until you're sure the lion's gone away. So, you know, to me, I thought it was very precipitate. I, uh, when I was down two weeks ago, um, you know, people not social distancing in the chamber, people not following one way rules in the tea room or sitting too many people at a table in the voting queue, which we call the Rees Mogg Conga, where we have to snake all through uh, the House of Commons and then into the lobbies. Just, um, yeah. Very, very few Conservatives wearing masks. I mean, a minority of MPs in total um, wearing masks and, and huddling. And, you know, often you were, you were ending up backing away because people were... We're coming towards you. So I, I, I found, the, I found the, the kind of following the rules by MPs quite poor and indeed some MPs who were mocking you if you were wearing a... You found that that's absolutely surreal. Yeah, okay. And uh, tell us a little bit about the state of play on the internal market bill. I, I saw you very give a very eloquent uh, intervention a few days ago, but uh, what, I mean, just t- talk about the state of play with that right now. Well, um, obviously, the Scottish Parliament voted overwhelmingly against giving a legislative consent motion for it yesterday. Um, And uh, the bill is now away to the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to see what what changes they might try to make to diminish some of the real damage in it. But equally, the, the... government ha- had put in some of their own amendments onto the bill that that actually emphasized some of the things so they have actually from some of the clauses they have disapplied the human rights act i mean normally there's a paragraph on the front of every piece of legislation which says i the secretary of state for whatever um you know verify that nothing in this bill uh you know counteracts the human rights act and and yet here we are with something where it goes well we're specifically cutting that out and we still have the clause that says you know notwithstanding anything in domestic or international law so it's you know it's very brazen but it does the two things it damages the northern ireland protocol which is where it breaks international law that's a that's a treaty that was signed the withdrawal agreement and the other thing is the complete hollowing out of devolution after 20 years. And, and that is just brazen, absolutely brazen. 
My reading on Brexit, I will, a few years ago, I was writing a book on American and, and uh, UK conservatism, and I, I, I came across uh, the I came across a, a, something about um, a, a group called Atlantic Bridge, and uh, you may, you may remember Liam Fox had to resign as, as defense minister because of his association with that. But uh, Atlantic Bridge basically is I don't know if you've heard of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council in the United States. They are an absolutely massive. I mean, practically every big company belongs to that. And they are in their system whereby they're able to basically write the bills and laws that are that are adopted mostly in the Republican uh, dominated uh, legislatures, of which there are quite a few. And they're behind things like voter suppression, uh, union busting. I mean, the list goes on and on. They're funded by the Koch brothers, you know, the whole. Uh, and so and I remember thinking when that uh, when when Atlantic Bridge had to d- disappear, you know, as as because it, it's, ba- it's basically a uh, you know a branch office of Alex Alec basically, and um, but I knew that when it disappeared that, that, that they they may have uh, taken away the they, they may have gotten rid of the, the 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 group, but that you know those networks still existed, and I, I and I was I was just wondering how it was going to come back, and in my view, I mean uh, it, I think Brexit is is. Is is that because they want? I think that there there is a wish to, you know, for the American multi mostly American multinationals to come in and, you know, and, and so they don't want any standards. They want to be able to privatize everything, and so I, I see that as a big force behind it. You know, is 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 primarily does that does that make sense? Does, do you think? That's oh, oh, I mean, I think that is. I think that's everyone's fear. I mean, obviously, uh, you know. In, in his state visit, Donald Trump talked about everything is on the table, including the NHS, and then was obviously told, oh, no, you can't say that, and, you know, backpedaled the next day. But, you know, if you look, I remember going through the, some of the trade papers from America, um, you know, a few years back, and, you know, they wanted rid of geographical protected indicators, so things like Scotch whiskey, Scotch salmon, Scotch beef. They, they had a major demand to sell their whiskey as scotch without the, uh, without the kind of standard rules. Obviously, the, the stuff like, you know, chlorinated chicken and hormone-fed beef, etc. cetera, um, you know, I referred to that in, in my speech. It's not the issue of the chlorine. You know, you, you'll swallow more than that in a swimming pool. Mm-hmm. But it's the fact of why things are washed in chlorine. And that's because uh, in certain sectors of American um, animal husbandry, the standards are poor. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overcrowding and they have literally 10 times the incidence of salmonella in chicken than uh, of people infected by salmonella Mm -hmm. uh, chicken than we do here. So, you know, these are the kind of things the public don't want that. They don't want the standards to go down. But there's also things, and and it won't say, you know, the NHS will not be mentioned in an American trade deal, but what it says is full market access. Mm -hmm. So some of the things they're against is um, central procurement, which Scotland is very good at in the NHS. So we Mm -hmm. had our own stockpile. We buy, you know, for buying new x-ray machines or CT machines or radiotherapy machines, they they go and they assess it as a group, and that's that's the make they go for for Scotland. So you you're buying seven, you're not just buying one. Um, they don't like that kind of thing. Certainly not central procurement of drugs. Um, mm-hmm. And there was an interesting piece, and I can't remember if it was a Newsnight piece or a Panorama or some or a Dispatches. It was uh, quite a long time ago. Um, might even have been the end of last year. But talking about that, um, basically. President Trump was determined that drugs would cost more here. He bizarrely blames the high costs of medicines in America on the fact that because we procure centrally in bulk, we get a better price here. So Mm -hmm. instead of him thinking about doing something like that, he wants to undermine that here. So, So you will have, and through the internal market bill, it clearly says the mutual recognition and non discrimination is that if something, you know, it's it's painted as if it's to protect products from different parts of the UK, mm-hmm. but it very clearly in both the clauses says, or passes through or is imported into mm-hmm. any part of the UK, it mm-hmm. must be accepted everywhere. So, so that's one of the things. Um, it also means that we can't set standards here in Scotland. So Scotland... Um, 
banned pras- uh, plastic um, cotton buds last year, uh, the first country to do that, we wouldn't be allowed to keep. So if there's a company somewhere else in the UK that still makes plastic stemmed cotton buds, we wouldn't be allowed to say they can't be sold. <laughs> we could say to a Scottish cotton bud producer, you have to follow our rules, but we still wouldn't be able to stop the, the plastic ones being sold. So we, we no longer can achieve the thing that we want, but suddenly we are putting an extra burden on our you know, farmers, food producers, whatever it is, but yet we're not achieving the thing that we're actually trying to achieve. And all of that is in there. And the last bit is this one clause 46. I don't know what number it is now with all the changes. And that is that the UK government takes the right to spend money in all of the devolved areas anywhere in the UK. Now people are going, oh, isn't that marvelous? How generous. But he who pays the piper calls the tune. So what you're talking about is they would decide what hospital is built, you know, water, electricity, everything. I mean, so the whole big list is almost all of devolution. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is that they will cut out the Scottish Parliament Mm -hmm. and they will make the financing decisions on investment in Scotland. And you're literally talking about pulling the guts out of devolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what what do you think? I've, I've always kind of speculated as to whether, you know, I know that Nicola Sturgeon has met several times with Barnier and, and uh, has, you know, they're in communication. But I'm just wondering if there is, you know, a, a real possibility of no deal Brexit, which would and, and, and this law passes and which pretty much allows the Brit- the UK government to, you know, I mean, completely di- 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 disempower, if not abolish the you know, holy road. I mean, how do you, how realistic a prospect do you, do you see and what, what can Scotland do to defend itself? I know that they're, you're doing everything you can with regard to, you know, the bill and trying to pass amendments and stuff like that. But if it really comes down to it, what do you think, I mean, what do you, how do you think Europe would react? Because of course they've got Northern Ireland as well, that they have to be very deeply concerned about. Uh, how do you see that it, just in your own experience? How do you see that possibly shaking well, out? I, I think that, I mean, obviously the issue with international law and the Northern Ireland Treaty has overshadowed the issues on devolution. Mm -hmm. Um, And therefore there may well be, you know, ordinary people in Europe who who don't see that to the same extent. Although I think the, the issue of the breaking international law, I think even your man or woman in the street in Berlin is conscious of that. There's been a lot of coverage in uh, European and German media around these things. And and you see it in the media here, a lot of discussion about that aspect and a bit of a mention about devolution. And, you know, I almost wondered, was it deliber- deliberate? I mean, they often do it at um, budgets that they put out something so outrageous, everyone gets worked up and then they pull it at the last minute. And all the other bad stuff goes through because people go, well, it could have been worse. You know, we could have had the granny tax or the pasty tax or, uh, you know, whatever it was that they were that they were kind of leading with on that occasion. I mean, there's certainly a lot of sympathy for Scotland uh, within Europe. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more understanding in 2014. I think most um, continental Europeans just didn't get what we were on about. Certainly my German, the German side of my family didn't get it at all. I mean, obviously Germany had reunified in 1990 and their view of the UK was kind of very sensible and multicultural and pragmatic and a very nice country. And why would you want to split it up? I mean, my family just didn't get it at all. Mm -hmm. The morning after the Brexit referendum, the 24th of June, 2016, Basically, they got in, tish, go, got in touch going, yeah, OK, we get it. You're a different yeah. country. And, and ever since then, I would say there is a, a lot of recognition of the position we're in. And I think more and more uh, with how the UK government has behaved towards Europe, towards Northern Ireland, but also the, the people who are more political in Europe. And the politicians will be aware of what's being done to devolution. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you know, a key nation like Germany, where the the kind of division of power between the lender and the Bundestag is very clear. It's in the constitution. There's a constitutional court. 
And the idea that the Bundestag would, would trample on, you know, the, the rights of Bavaria or Nordrhein-Westfalen or something like, I mean, it, you know, they just wouldn't even contemplate it. So, you know, there's more of an understanding. There's a lot more sympathy. I don't think we're going to have, you know, a major European coming out and going, OK, if you vote yes, we'll take you in you know, in six months or, or whatever. But I think what we will get and what we've already had from Tusk, from Elmar Brock, from Guy Verhofstadt is I think we will have more leading Europeans being open about being welcoming towards Scotland in, a, in an informal way once the UK has finally left, once the transition is, is over with. I think we will have more of that. And it will be important that we're getting people to understand that there is an open mind um, for us to come in because Scotland has a lot to offer Europe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned when we were speaking earlier about your uh, whistleblower bill. I was just wondering, uh, I, I mean, talk a little bit about it. And then what are the prospects for it actually being adopted or passing. I mean, I, you know, it's just like we see just what, what the, the, just the, the circus, whatever, you know, so much, you know, the, 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 the parliamentary procedure is so incredibly complicated. I mean, is, is, uh, you know, is, is that something that could possibly pass or how do you, how do you see well, it? We, we had the second reading on the 25th of September, and, and that's why I had to go. All right? well, had explain to go a little bit and, about that, about the first reading, second reading. Third, what, the what, first what? reading was in February, but the first reading isn't a reading. The first reading is you simply say the name of your bill, and it's presented to the clerk, and that's it. That's the first reading. So the main debate is what's the second reading. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would go to committee where it gets hammered about and you knock all the rough edges off it and, and then report stage, the report of the committee, and then the third reading, if it passes, it goes to the Lord. So that's the kind of stages any bill goes through. But the, the key one is generally around the, the second reading. Now, the private members' bills are read on a Friday morning uh, between half nine and half past two, the first bill may be able to force a vote and therefore has at least some chance of getting through. If the government don't want it to go through, then they will filibuster it and they will talk it out and they will uh, have all sorts of people who will stand up and read shopping lists or, you know, recite kind of Shakespeare or whatever you like to fill the time because if the minister or a government person or the debate is simply still continuing at half two, then there isn't a vote and it falls. Um, with mine, the bill before, actually, uh, a lot of work had been done and the government were supporting it. Um, but it meant that uh, they, it went through without a vote, um, but it still only finished at quarter to two. So, you know, I had 45 minutes. For mine, there was no, there's no possibility of having a vote on the second one. Now we didn't have a lot of people because with COVID, you know, MPs are not generally hanging around Westminster on a Friday. But the people who were there supported it, and that was cross-party. That was Labour, ourselves, the Conservatives. You know, there's a lot of cross-party interest in trying to reform whistleblower legislation because it's disastrous. It's absolutely hopeless. So a lot of support. And then the minister got up and it was basically, we're fine. We, we don't need to do anything. We have the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which was passed in 1998. Now that was a private member's bill. And it's always described as if it protects whistleblowers. And one of the problems is that whistleblowers think they are protected by it. Mm -hmm. And then they discover that, you know, they raise an issue and then all of a sudden they're a troublemaker and they don't get promotion or they face constructive dismissal and they're driven out of their jobs. About a third of whistleblowers mm -hmm. will end up driven out of their jobs. And the bill, PETA, Public Interest Disclosure Act, the only thing it allows you to do is to go to an employment tribunal against your employer after mm -hmm. you have suffered detriment and to try and get some kind of compensation. And the success rate is 3% of people who actually go all the way to an employment tribunal. So that isn't protection, it isn't just, 
we've politicians all the time, Jeremy Hunt used to do it all the time, saying how marvelous whistleblowers are and they come forward and they raise issues and they protect patients. But in actual fact, we don't protect that. And that's what my bill was trying to do, to set up a, a kind of independent uh, whistleblower's office that would set standards both for companies and the public services, um, and, and that then they would be auditing that, and they would also be a place that whistleblowers could go to or be in touch with if they weren't making any progress locally. Now, public services are devolved, so the NHS in Scotland um, did pass uh, legislation to set up the Independent National Whistleblowers Office, and they have published their standards last year and consulted on them. But obviously, everything's a bit held back by COVID. So Scotland is, is leading in that, but we've not been able to deliver the change because of COVID. But they're at least on the right track. Okay. I want to get to a couple of the uh, qu questions from our audience. Um, sure. um, it, to, the, to, the, to the degree of liberty that you wish to discuss this, uh, do the Westminster SNP MPs have any plans to or held any discussions on competing the Scottish Grand Committee? Um, I mean, that has come up in conversation before. Um, the problem is, in a, in a lot of ways, it's then felt as if that's actually cooperating uh, with what's happening in, uh, and, and, and basically suggesting that the, the Secretary of State for Scotland and Scottish MPs would make decisions in Westminster for, uh, for Scotland. So it, it, people have put it forward in the past, but there isn't, I wouldn't say there's uh, any particular plans at the moment to go ahead with something like that. Obviously, there's the Scottish Affairs Committee uh, chaired by Pete Wishart, and they've actually done some very good work. I mean, it's not all been on Scotland, but things like drug legislation, where we want to take a public health approach, but the Home Office are not allowing us, which is stupid. I mean, drug deaths and the management of addiction is a challenge everywhere. So why not allow Scotland to pilot some innovative approaches to it, mm -hmm. which then Westminster could decide whether they wanted to follow suit later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any plans for strategic ch changes in the running of our NHS, particularly given the context of Brexit? Uh, well, not so much strategic. I mean, obviously, there need to be preparations. And, you know, I know people are talking about, oh, what if it's a no deal? You know, actually, the deal the UK government are asking for is already a very hard deal. So there will be bureaucracy, there will be extra costs mm. uh, in importing drugs, exporting drugs, all of these kind of things. So, uh, you know, bringing in radioisotopes, which you can't stockpile, which I've been raising since 2016. So, you know, there'll be a lot of organizational things, but I wouldn't say that it would change the strategic approach to NHS Scotland. I mean, our aim will still be to keep a unified public NHS. But I think what has definitely been recognised in the COVID crisis is the state of care. Now, Scotland is the only UK nation to provide free personal care, mm -hmm. and that allows us to keep more people in their own homes. So, so actually about two thirds of people getting social care are not in care homes, they're in their own homes. Mm -hmm. But what it has meant is that people who actually have to be supported in a care home have a really high frailty level. They need a lot of help or else we'd be supporting them at home. So, our, you know, our care homes are, are, have a very vulnerable population in them, um, but also they're mostly privately run. Almost 90% of them are privately run. And some of them are very, very expensive. You know, 50,000 a year, this kind of Price. So I think that, you know, we've already heard from the Secretary of State, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary, that um, there is a plan for a review of social care to look at, you know, actually getting integration to work. It's been Scottish government policy for six years. And some places have done really well, but I think there's a recognition that we need to look at a national care service and whether that is a, a national care service separate to the NHS or becomes a national health and care service, that would all come out of the review. So that's probably 
the biggest strategic change. Mm -hmm. um, from my own point of view, what I want to see a, a difference is a move a little bit away from always focusing on illness and actually focusing on well-being. So mm -hmm. we've heard the First Minister talk about the well-being economy. Mm -hmm. Scotland was the founder of the well-being economy government's uh, global group with mm -hmm. Iceland and New Zealand. And a lot of our policies from the baby box to free personal care are all about the well-being of citizens. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have that approach, but I think we still need to get more radical in looking at what gives you health as opposed to how to manage illness. Mm -hmm. I used to always say it should be called the National Illness Service, but who on earth would want to work in it? So, you know, early years, housing, education, nutrition, these are all the things that actually drive health mm -hmm. and well-being. And, and that's what I would like to see. And we talk about it post-COVID, that we want to build forward, not backwards. We want to you know, build something better than we came out of. So greener, more circular, more sustainable, but also fairer and more focused on a well-being economy. And to me, that's the clear blue water between staying in the UK and going for independence. It's clear, regardless of what Boris Johnson said the other day, that they will want to go back to business as usual, where the ultra rich are the ones who gain from everything. We don't want to be part of that. We want the chance to actually build a fairer country. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Bruce on Periscope, how do you manage to work in that theatrical environment with this stupid buffoonery? <laughs> uh, sometimes it's very annoying. I mean, obviously, there, there are times when it's been lighthearted and, uh, and that's fine. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to be part of more serious debates because I'm nearly always talking about, you know, health and illness and so on. So, you know, I'm not usually someone who's cracking lots of jokes. As one of the most senior medics in the house, I'm, I'm normally trying to just share my experience, my knowledge, um, because the depth of knowledge is often quite shallow uh, considering the decisions that are being made. And sometimes I have been quite shocked at at that. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it gets, you know, very annoying. I mean, some of the conventions are tedious. And I mean, even going back to the virtual parliament, you know, for people with, uh, you know, relapsing illness or a disability, even myself, when I had smashed my ankle last autumn, I was being dragged up and down to Westminster in a wheelchair, you know, manhandled off and on planes for six weeks. Whereas, you know, with technology, I could have taken part from here. So to me, there's a lot of things that in a way have had to be developed that they should hang on to. Every other organization is going, what have we learned from this? What will we go back to? But what will we keep hold of? Whereas there, they are such traditionalists. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they plan to spend billions on refurbishing the parliament only mm -hmm. to basically rebuild a 19th century parliament instead of a 21st century parliament. Yeah, okay. Um, if a deal is made by the UK government with the US, will Scotland have to accept the deal if, uh, if we then become independent? Oh, not if we become independent, no. Uh, obviously not. Uh, our trade policy would be our own, but I mean, if we're not independent, then uh, you know anything in any trade deal will be forced on us, but also whether the the, UK government decides to lower certain standards, cut red tape as they love to describe it, etc. Um, all of that through the internal market bill would affect us. Simply, mm -hmm. it takes away the right of the Scottish Parliament to say these are our standards and regulations, which we have at the moment. And you know, the UK internal market, which is a completely new name has survived variation up until now. I mean, one of the bizarre ones they've put in is building regulations. Now, it's not as if you're moving buildings backwards and forwards over the border, but we've got much stricter building regulations. The type of cladding that burnt in Grenfell was not on any of our, uh, you know, council houses or social housing. Um, you have to put sprinklers in if a building is 18 metres tall in Scotland it doesn't have to be put in until it's 30 meters in England. 
you know, any material that you're putting on a building <coughs> needs to be completely um, fire retardant. And, and so these kind of things, so safety measures that, that have evolved in Scotland that we have thought were important suddenly are, are, are being undermined and would only apply to our producers. Mm. So a builder coming up from England would be allowed to build a house at a much lower standard than a Scottish builder. So all you end up doing, and it becomes a driver to deregulation and a disincentive to set any standard, because that standard is only a burden for your own businesses. It can't stop the bad practice that might come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that applies whether it's a UK business or whether it's uh, either goods or services coming from, uh, you know, coming from America, which is obviously the one we tend to, um, no offense, Mark, but, you know, that's the one we tend to worry about because of their approach to healthcare, the drug pricing, the, the food standards, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, I know. Absolutely. In the in the U.S., I think it was in 2004. They uh, there was a, a, the thing with drug prices, and uh, they but basically they the, in the bill because there were so many lobbyists and you know so many millions of dollars being pumped into the the, the coffers of the of the, of the politicians. Uh, they they um, they excluded Medicare from being able to negotiate drug prices. I mean, it's just it's just lunacy. Like the, so, you know, and, you know, and that's what they'd be looking to do here. Yeah. I mean, there's NICE in England for England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And in Scotland, we have the Scottish Medicines Consortium, which looks at all the evidence on a drug mm -hmm. and versus the cost and, and weighs up whether this new super wonder drug is really a super wonder drug and is it worth £100,000 a month for the difference it makes. So yeah. they make a decision and they will say, no, you can't, or yes, you can. And the part of the US trade demands will be that that is gone mm -hmm. and that central procurement of the whole NHS in Scotland is gone. And, and as I say, it won't mention NHS in that trade deal. It will just talk about full market access on everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, John Paul Warlow, uh, the thing I'm, I'm quite scared of is, is a lot of my mental health medication comes from Europe. And my concern is what would happen if that medication doesn't come in, as I worry it will make me ill again. And so in some, some ways I'm kind of desperate for us to, to go our own way. Uh, well, I think uh, probably most of us on this call are desperate to go our own way for many different reasons. But when I was campaigning in the referendum in 2016, I highlighted there's five big health gains that we lose because of Brexit. So one is the workforce, like my German husband, who worked here as a GP for well over 30 years. Um, and yet we've already had a 90% drop in European nurses. The second is medicines that we import. Now, we, we import and export a similar number. We actually export more to Europe than we import, but they're different. So the UK doesn't make any insulin. It imports all of its insulin. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that that won't happen, but the worry is the extra cost on every packet because of the extra bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And also the fear in the early part of next year of lorries all being jammed up around Dover because most mm -hmm. medicines come in around kind of Dover, Calais. Uh, we're losing our, our reciprocal healthcare, our little EHIC card that we've all had. The, yeah. the research network, Europe is the biggest medical research and scientific research network in the world. It's bigger than America or China. America, America's, well, been, America's been in decline in that sense. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, I mean, there, there was so much money being put into that on basic research. And that's, I don't know if that's... But, but it's one of the reasons that we get access to drugs quicker than the likes of Canada and Australia, because the EU is such a huge market. Uh, new drugs are launched in America and Europe at a very similar time. Mm -hmm. The others wait, you know, half a year, a year, even up to three years before the, it's worth the drug company's while to go through all the paperwork and machinations to register and license the drug there. So, you know, all of these things will, will reduce our access to drugs um, and increase the cost. I mean, what I would say to our, uh, our, our listener is to make sure that you have that conversation with your doctor. Um, looking at where it's coming from. The government asked pharmaceutical firms last year to stockpile 
um, six weeks of normal drugs, three months of insulin. Now, the problem is a lot of these stockpiles have been used up during COVID, um, and not all of them are easy to restockpile because obviously there's many parts of the world where drug production is down because of COVID. And the pharmaceutical firms were asked again just recently in the summer to recreate these stockpiles and have said that is not necessarily possible because we, do, you know, we just can't access them. So I think it is worth talking to your doctor about where does it come from? Is it a common drug that's likely to therefore be in the stockpiles? Um, to, to make sure that particularly, you know, the worst time is going to be the first weeks um, because I think it will be shambolic. I think it will be chaotic. So is making sure that you've got a prescription, that you've got your drugs for that very, you know, don't, don't just turn up for a prescription in January. You know, make sure that you have a prescription that will take you through sort of Christmas and January and, and even into February to get through those initial weeks. Um, okay. But it will add cost and it, it will uh, be a cost burden, both importing from the EU, but also if America does drive up drug prices, you know, if we're spending extra millions on drugs, not new drugs, just the drugs we're already using, then that's millions we're not spending on cancer treatment or hip replacements or cataracts. So, you know, if it, it's just wasted money, it's not any benefit to patients at all. Yeah. Um, an another one, medical medication related. Uh, why are people's medication getting changed to, <clears throat> changed to cheaper versions and are getting told they the one they have is unavailable now? Um, well, there, there, there's a, probably two issues a little bit tangled in here. There's a thing called generics, uh, which is when a patent has run out. So a new drug is often very expensive for the NHS and it's most expensive in the early years. And then after a number of years, the patent is finished and other companies can produce the same drug um, and they are called generics. So they're not, it's not the trade name, it's now a common. So it's like buying Morrison's own baked beans. They're mm -hmm. still baked beans, you may like them, you may like them more, you may like them less, but they're pretty much the same thing. So for the NHS, they're able to save millions of pounds by changing to the generics. Um, and that therefore means we can do something else. Um, one of the other issues, though, that can be happening at the moment is we have had a lot more drug shortages in the last year than we would normally have. There's always some, you know, manufacturing problems, sourcing problems, but there's been a lot more about three or four times the, the number we would expect. And some of that, I think, has been to do with creating stockpiles. There's only two ways to create a stockpile. Either you increase production, and that isn't always possible, or you skim a little bit off the top in every day, in every run, and put that in a stockpile. And of course, that action can itself drive a shortage. And the other thing is people who are getting anxious about getting their drugs, kind of creating their own little mini stockpile. And that can happen anywhere between the factory, the wholesaler, the pharmacist, or the patient. And if all of them are hoarding little bits of drugs just in case, then you create a shortage. So the, the act of creating stockpiles tends to create shortages. But the underlying principle of changing to generics, that's something the NHS has been doing for 15, 20 years. And that's just, we have to make sure that we're always getting best value for money. And for most patients, the generic drug works just as well. Occasionally, it doesn't agree with them. And then the GP will often look at, well, okay, does the trade one work better for you or even a different generic? But they do save millions of pounds, which can then be spent on other drugs or other treatments. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and why do you, I mean, why do you think that the conservative government wants to uh, withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights? I mean, what what are they not what are they not able to do now that they would be able to do with, uh, with if they were no longer bound by the ECHR? Well, obviously, this came up under Theresa May, and that was her wish to be able to deport, um, uh, you know, terrorists. It came up with the Abu Hamza case and and obviously she was very angry as home secretary that she couldn't just deport him uh, that even someone like him had rights um under the echr 
Um, and, uh, you know, so they, they were talking, I mean, even in the 2017 election, talking about having a UK Bill of Rights and, and leaving that. And then that all toned down because it became clear that the EU were not going to be, uh, were not going to be happy to do a deal um, if they were leaving the, the European Convention. Now, that has all come back up again, and they're talking about that they will leave it. And that's part of what then means that the the kind of justice and policing and security cooperation can't go ahead. So at the moment, there's a lot of information sharing. Um, there's the European arrest warrant, you know, that if you're stopped for speeding and when they check your name, you're wanted for child abuse in Spain, you know, you, you get taken there yeah. and then on that a European arrest warrant that's out for you. And and that opportunity gets lost um, because we that you know we're not going to see that on on you know our police on the beat are not going to see that information because we will no longer be part of any of these systems because we will not guarantee to abide by the Convention of Human Rights and therefore other countries are going to say well you know I, we're not having our citizens dragged into this when we can't trust how you're going to behave. Um, in, in Ireland, the European arrest warrant is used by Northern Ireland police in Southern Ireland, you know, to put out a, a warrant for someone's arrest. So the chief constable there, the former chief constable, they've been talking about that since 2016, about what an issue it would be if this is lost. So lots of things that we were told, of course we'll do that. Of course we'll rem remain a member. Of course we will work together. These things are unraveling. So even if there's a deal, you know, I mean, it'll buy, be like peace in our time. Boris Johnson will wave his bit of paper, but it's going to be a very thin bit of paper um, with a huge amount of things that we will still be losing. And still all of that bureaucracy on trade, on our seafood, you know, all of our exports that go to Europe, extra costs on things that are coming into the UK. Mm -hmm. And how grim could it get? Do you, I mean, your view. I mean, I've, I did a, a video of, a couple of years ago on what, what it would mean to leave the EU. Things like, uh, you know, air airlines being not being able to legally le take off and land. Um, you know, of course, the, the food standards, medical standards uh, block, you know, basically um, impossibility of, of, of trading and the trucks taking eight hours to go through Dover rather than just flying on and off. I mean, I, I, nobody has a crystal ball and can see, but I mean, how, I mean, and in, and in that context, how do you see Scotland faring uh, if, you know, uh, if, if, uh, if, the, if these worst fears get realized? Um, well, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm not wanting to, to frighten uh, people who are listening, and, and there are people who are aware of this, but I'm on the uh, EU Future Relationship Committee under Hillary Benn and with my colleague Joanna Cherry. And, you know, we are hearing, we heard just a few weeks ago from the Road Haulage Association and kind of, you know, customs experts and so on who are saying the systems are still not there. We're being told they'll be there by the end of December, but we need to train our staff. And obviously, you know, the information that was put out by Michael Gove himself talking about the delays at Dover and so on, you know, the, the UK, the, the EU is going to grant certain things because the EU is, in essence, playing the grown up here and saying, right, OK, your planes can fly but they can only fly in and out. They can't triangulate. They can't go from London to Bonn to Zurich to London. They can just go one way and back, and that'll be for a certain length of time. And we'll allow some of your lorries to do that. But a lot of our uh, food imports are actually driven by European haulage companies. Right. So right. if they come into the UK and then think that actually their driver could end up spending a day and a half in Kent, trying to get back out again, you know, we'd be in danger of them saying, you know what, actually, it's a real problem to go there. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, I, th I think it could get really quite chaotic. Mm -hmm. I think that all the players who are involved in that road haulage and customs are all trying to get prepared. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here we are in October. We've got two and a half months until this kicks in. And, you know, the technology is not yet there. The things are not published. So, you know, simply how do you train your drivers? How do you train 
people to handle the systems when they still can't see the systems. Um, so I think the very beginning uh, will be quite problematic. Now, the UK government have said for the first six months, they're just going to let stuff in, you know, so, so that food can get in, so that there, there isn't a problem. But obviously, the EU is going to protect its single market. So for exporters, for small companies that export, that will apply from the 1st of January. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can be that haulage can get in here. But as I say, if they're going to have to sit for a day and a half to get back onto continental Europe, very quickly, you know, it's a circular trade. So very yeah. quickly, uh, you may find haulage firms saying, you know what, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I'd also uh, just uh, also that the um, that uh, uh, normally under a no deal Brexit, even like uh, uh, there, there won't be the reciprocity on recognition of driver's licenses, for example. So and but but it, but from it's very interesting that, uh, that, you, uh, that we brought this up. It, it, what, what, what else can you tell us about the way that, you know, that, that the EU was seeing a no deal Brexit? Because I had these nightmares of just, you know, first of January, you know, lines of trucks from Dover to. Manchester, you know, that, uh, how do you how do you see the Europeans approaching this? Well, I think like um, you know the comments about equivalence and um, you know allowing planes to fly and this kind of thing. I think that you know what Europe will will do. I mean, uh, uh, this is what I think they will do is that for some of these absolutely lifeline services, they will they will kind of give a little bit of breathing space and say, right, we're going to recognize this but it's not going to be how it is now so you know it'll it'll be are, are you one of the hauliers who can get one of the certificates to allow you to drive there mm -hmm. but like airplanes they won't be able to do what's called cabotage they won't be allowed to take a load to paris and then pick a load up in lyon and take something from paris to lyon in between to again triangulate and make the whole thing economical they'll be able mm -hmm. to go to paris and either pick something up or deliver something, but they won't be able to kind of do multi-load either to another country or within a country. And a lot of those things just start to make it not good business sense. Right. And, right. and that's the problem. So, so again, your costs go up. Costs will be passing on to us. Um, we may well end up with you know, lower choices. So all the things, I mean, we, we import something like 40% of our food from Europe. And we've got quite spoilt at, you know, having things all year round, having a wide selection. Some of that may not be there so mm -hmm. easily next year. Okay. All right. Um, f finally, we've just got a few minutes left, but uh, in light of the most recent speech by Boris Johnson about refusing any Section 30 order for IndyRef2, what would be your strategy to ensure that people are given the opportunity to choose uh, independence, basically? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think it has to be front and centre of the manifesto next year. And I think people have to get behind that. I know that people are all talking about, well, let's, you know, let's use our list vote for, you know, one of the brand new parties, etc. I can tell you at Westminster, they never talk about the fact that we have an independent supporting majority in Holyrood. Mm -hmm. It's just, what did the SNP get? And so the worry is if our list vote went away down, they'll go, well, you put independence in your manifesto and, you know, your proportional vote went down to 37. So clearly the Scottish people don't want independence. The, it, it's still that the biggest block is not Boris Johnson. The biggest block is that 45% or more of Scots do not yet believe in Scotland as a country with a positive future in its own right. And that's the job that we have to do. And if you start to have bigger and bigger numbers, it puts him on a huge pressure to honour democracy. But then it also does open up other options of saying, right, well, we're taking him to court because, you know, he's obstructing this. And, but this idea that you don't bother asking him, oh, we'll not bother asking for Section 30 because he said no. We have to make sure that the pressure is on him. Because the key thing is we want international recognition and we particularly want European recognition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to be seen to have done everything we can to have, if you like, the gold standard independence referendum. That's what we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the more his behavior would get ridiculous and anti-democratic, 
then the more the international community would kind of go, well, you did your best. We recognize that. And mm -hmm. you might reach a point where you've gone to court, Scottish Parliament is calling a referendum, but we have to go through all the steps and right. push and keep that pressure for a democratic choice on him, not saying, oh, we're just going to go off and do something else. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, on that note, um, I, I just want to apologize to all our viewers. There were many, many more questions than, than, than we were able to address. So I, uh, I apologize, but I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to talk with us this evening about, uh, to, to, to be more of a doctor's consultation, but <laughs> constitutional issues, but it was, a, it was a delightful talking to you. Well, thanks very much, Mark. And thank you to your viewers and take care and stay safe. Okay. All right. Thank you. What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We are an internet radio station and you can find us at www.indielive.radio. We are a community of volunteer broadcasters to entertain and inform. Click on the schedule tab to find out what's on every day of the week. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have, and we're on 24-7. There's something for everyone, so please give us a try. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. Indie Live Radio is a new voice for a new Scotland. Join us. Thanks for listening. Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide.
can you watch this again? Can you be part of it? Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. The What's On Guide to Live Stream Events and Shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide. And I know, yes I know. I'm, I'm Clough. And I'm Russ. And I'm fr we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign, uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independent Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. This song we wrote about five minutes ago called Carpe Diem. Hope over fear. Are you threatened by words from an empire of money and gold? Will you chain in your country's potential for the lies you've been sold? Are you scared that the walls are too high to be breached by the bold? Will you stand and be counted or shut up and do what you're told? Hope over fear, don't be afraid Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave well, you seize the day. Rip the chains from the unicorn. Scotland's no longer your slave. Let the TV man call you a nationalist for rejecting the lies. <laughs> Are the wobs of the few off the bob? Cause he wears shots and ties. When they tell you that Scotland's no great, are you really surprised? Will you stand and be counted for something that money can't buy? Hope oh, oh, 
future rising Lies and deceit From traitors was surprising You showed the way And gave us inspiration The seeds are sown To once more